Our next poet, a Renaissance man, a Canadian cultural catalyst, Don Cullen. Delighted to be here, just delighted. The spirit of the Bohemian Embassy thrives. You kind of got the feeling that none of this would be happening without Don. I would not be where I am, I would not have the career I have, I would not have the life that I have had Don Cullen and the Bohemian Embassy pointed the way. You just knew you'd be okay. Surely, you wouldn't get really, stage fright or yeah, anything because yeah. you'd done all of that at the Bohemian Embassy. Mm. Why is there something rather than nothing? Was the question sincere or was Leibniz just bluffing? If there was nothing, there would be no there there, begging the question for us to ask where where. I was brought up a fundamentalist Christian and I learned the Bible pretty well, for which I am grateful. And my parents felt because they were perhaps a little bit more blessed financially than uh, a lot of other people, that they should have the Lord's work being performed at, at our house. So we did a lot of entertaining with missionaries and uh, uh, clergymen. And, and uh, there was a lady who lived with us for a while uh, and uh, she um, had a radio and my parents had moral contortions about buying a radio. It was uh, the outbreak of World War II, II that uh, encouraged them to get a radio. But uh, prior to that, the, the world, the flesh and the devil would be coming through the, the radio and uh, that was not acceptable. So they were quite puritanical. Uh, but this lady was a United Church lady who uh, listened to the opera on Saturday afternoons. And um, since I wasn't, wasn't able to go to uh, the movies, you know, the Saturday afternoon matinee, <laughs> um, I would uh, listen to Die Goethe Dammerung or, or some Wagnerian <laughs> opera. Nobody told me that it was difficult, so I enjoyed it and uh, uh, developed a, a kind of interest in classical music. I went to High Park Baptist Church on some levels, I'm very grateful for that because it caused me to be really interested in philosophy. And as a result, I went through a period of, I would say, about 11 years uh, before I finally came to the conclusion that I didn't believe in the supernatural at all. So I became an atheist. The Bible's full of babble. But it's useful for playing Scrabble <laughs> and motivating rabble, just the thing. When I went to Humberside Collegiate, I had developed a really good facility imitating teachers. And, uh, and that was uh, so that the kids would come up to me and say, Hey, Don, do Mr. Taylor. You know, do Mr. McClellan, do Mr. <laughs> and so I would do these uh, for the entertainment of my peers. And then I was dared to go into the drama club. And the first thing that we did, uh, uh, I was able to use uh, a New England accent because we did Our Town by Thornton Wilder. And uh, I began to realize that I did this rather well, actually. <laughs> and uh, people encouraged me and so forth. And I auditioned for a group called the Young Canada Players, but my father was uh, adamant that I not participate in that, uh, partly because they uh, rehearsed on Sunday. <laughs> and uh, uh, other, other than that, I think the entertainment business was uh, very suspect in our family. I noticed that I really wanted to work at CBC because I adored CBC radio so much. And um, so I kept bugging a lady by the name of Marjorie Hand. 
Finally, she said, we've got a job for you in the TV news department as the lowest form of life. You would be a copy clerk there. That was uh, wonderfully fortuitous for me because I stayed there for almost four years. And during that time, I started the Bohemian Embassy Coffee House and uh, all that that entails. There was a character in the television news department who didn't like the Celebrity Club, which was across the street from the CBC on Jarvis. And he got a group of people who were willing to put $100 in a piece, and uh, he would equal that. And as we were going in for the first meeting, he turned to me and he said, Don, will you chair the meeting? And I said, uh, why? You know, I don't have a, an agenda. This is your idea. No, Don, please, please do, you know. So I ended up chairing the meeting. And I just said, what kind of a club would you like to have? And everybody looked at each other and said, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, I had visited a, a house on uh, Indian Grove. Uh, Harry Mills had this house. He was the president of the High Park Tennis Club. And he had a kind of combination between an Edwardian salon and a beatneck hangout. Uh, in his house. He had a bunch of musical instruments. He had an enormous record collection and people would go there almost every night to have coffee and, and uh, that stuck in my mind. So we started the Bohemian Embassy with $500 and then I went off to the University of Toronto with uh, flyers that I made on a, a duplicating machine at the CBC. <laughs> and uh, uh, I would go to football games, and if I saw a little knot of people after the game, I would go up to them and say, would you like some subversive literature? I felt that a coffee house should really be omnivorous. Let's, uh, let's have a place where all kinds of different things happen. And uh, the, all of the other places were one kind of function, and that was it. And uh, to be sure, folk music was making most of our money, but uh, I thought to myself, should we have a, um, a reading series? And I have read my family history because it is my responsibility to know who I am that I might take all necessary precautions against my own vicious inclinations. There was, in fact, a subculture of literary people in Toronto, and Margaret Atwood came out of that, Gwen McEwen, um, Al Purdy, who's now a statue in Queen's Park, and uh, all these wonderful people. and. Uh, a chap came up to me one day and he said, why don't you do a, a satirical review here, like Spring Thaw, but in a cabaret kind of situation. And uh, eventually I said, why don't you do it? And we put together uh, a show called The Village Review that got an amazing rave review from Nathan Cohen, who is a very, very difficult reviewer on the star. And all of a sudden we had people all the way down two flights of stairs along St. Nicholas Street and along Wellesley to, to um, uh, Young trying to get in. I had to go down and say, I'm sorry, you <laughs> we can only seat 150. <laughs> Barry Baldaro said to me, I want you to be in the show. And I said, no, Barry, that, that, that's bad taste, bad form. I own the place. And he said, no, but you can do a Russian accent. And we, we've got this sketch that uh, needs a Russian accent. And so I went into the, the show. And within two and a half years, I was on Broadway 
with Beyond the Fringe, the all-time granddaddy of, of satirical shows. Uh, and wow, you know, it, it just happened that way. And I, I consider myself incredibly lucky. There was a kid by the name of uh, Lorne Lipowitz, and Lorne changed his name a few years later to Michaels and founded Saturday Night Live. Lorne came to me, I guess, after he'd been at uh, the University of Toronto and had directed a show at uh, the University College. I think they called it the Follies or something like that. He, I went up to his place and I heard the real to real uh, show and it was not very good. But uh, Lauren said, I hear you're doing another review at the Bohemian Embassy. And I said, yes, but it's only two of us, Barry Baldaro and myself, a two-man review. And uh, he said, let me direct it. So eventually he did. So he directed the first show and it, it had legs, as people say. And uh, we played at the Bohemian Embassy. We went to Ottawa and played at Libu. And we went to, uh, I guess, North Bay and a couple of other places because it was a portable show. And uh, came back and Lauren and his girlfriend, uh, Rosalind Schuster, said, why don't the three of us uh, produce the show at the um, Colonnade Theater? And uh, we did. We produced the show there, and uh, uh, Frank Schuster, Roz's father, came to the show. And out of that, I got 25 years on Wayne and Schuster. <laughs> Talk about luck, you know, like, wow. <laughs> I just walked into these things. I saw Beyond the Fringe at the O'Keefe Center. Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, Alan Bennett, and Jonathan Miller. And uh, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I mean, I was rolling with laughter and the in insight and the idea that a show expected the audience to know something. When I uh, read in the newspaper that they were having open auditions at the O'Keefe Center for Beyond the Fringe, I went down, why not? And uh, a year and a bit later, I got a phone call from New York and uh, they said, would you like to be in Beyond the Fringe? And I said, how much do I owe you? <laughs> because, uh, you know, I thought, what a privilege that was. And I, I think I preferred the stage because the audience tells you how you're doing. That's, that's wonderful. You know, you listen to the audience and, and uh, if you have a funny line, laughter pe peaks and then it starts to die down. And there are one or two th places in the descend descending sound where you hit them with the next line. And it's, it's a, a game, it's like playing chess, only there's no loser. <laughs> you, you, you're both, the, the audience and the performers are winners <laughs> in, in that situation. And, and that to me is, is so rewarding. Why would there be nothing just because we conceive it? If there was nothing, no one would perceive it. Here is an answer you might as well book it. There can't be just nothing. Where would you put it? <laughs> well, I'm Inspector McKechn of Scotland Yard. McKechn of the Yard? Aye, the game's afoot. <laughs> this is my first trip on the flounder. What's a captain really like? I joined Wayne and Schuster in 1965. I was always a little insecure because I didn't know whether my contract would be renewed, but it always was. <laughs> so when I was a kid, I saw Alec Guinness on British films, and he was radically different from one role to another. 
and you almost had a hard time recognizing him. And I thought, boy, that's an actor. And I used to like to go into the makeup people and say, can you give me a mustache or a beard or a, a pair of glasses or whatever it was, because I, I kind of like to run into people who say, said, uh, you were on Wayne and Schuster? I never saw you on Wayne and Schuster. <laughs> and that, that, that act actually made me feel good. And they kept me around for, to do uh, dialect work, a, a lot of that sort of thing. Man is a wanderer by nature, constantly piqued by curiosity. And let the kettle to the trumpet speak. <laughs> Well, we all got to talk that way at Stratford. I did, Captain, but it just couldn't accept your last remark. Back to uh, the Bohemian Embassy, and I was exposed to an awful lot of teenage angst <laughs> and uh, uh, some bad poetry and uh, some heroic attempts and sometimes a line or two or, or a, a, a complete poem would knock me sideways because it was eloquent and stated something uh, that was meaningful. Having all of this input and eventually uh, say, well, I'll try a poem or two and I've got this idea and some something's niggling away at me that I want to express and I'll do it this way you know so then I began to realize that uh, poetry could actually be used politically uh, philosophically don't say that God was invented out of fear don't say the Almighty is a metaphor for what we do not know don't tell me humankind is the only responsible agency for what happens on the planet. Don't say the buck stops only here. Don't talk to me about personal responsibility. Do not take the breast away from me. And it just seems to me that uh, we have to be very, very careful on planet Earth because I don't think that the supernatural is going to bail us out. I don't have that confidence because I, I don't believe in the supernatural. I think the buck stops here. We are responsible. I remember when I became an atheist, I didn't say, hey, now I can do anything. Now I said, hey, the responsibility divulges on me. A great deal of, of the success of my life is a matter of luck, which I understand is probably true for a lot of people in the arts. Just stumbling into the right situation at the right time and bingo, something happens. My name is Donald Austin Cullen and I am all of these things because I am insecure, because I am vulnerable because I belong to the human species. What do you do when the left side of your brain is about equal to the right? What do you do when a little gray cloud, not black, not white, but gray, follows you about, never dropping rain, at least partially blocking the sun? What do you do when your opponents seem reasonable? When your allies lack sense or conviction? You stand partially erect and in a voice not soft, not loud, announce, I am a Canadian, and semi-proud of it. <laughs> 